been in a character study of the book of Esther over the past five weeks, and we are leaning in today to the to the book's title character, Esther. Today we look and study a little bit of who she is and the role God plays in her life. And as we do that, we understand and recognize that this young woman has a unique kind of set of traits about her that make her perfect for what God's about to do. About to do. First thing is this, Esther was an orphan. We learned that early on in the book of, of Esther when it says that Mordecai adopted her after her parents had died. So we know that she was an orphan. So she would have been vulnerable, but then she was brought in and kept safe. So we recognize there's this identity issue going on. Then we know this, she's beautiful. And scripture goes to great lengths to describe that this young woman was beautiful. She was the most beautiful woman out of an empire that spanned from India to Turkey, over 127 provinces. She was beautiful in form and feature. It's every dad's worst nightmare that your daughter is beautiful in form and feature, and you're like, no, but this is what she was. She was beautiful, and she was seen as such. She was also very young. She would have, um, she would have been in that teenage range right? Kind of that teenage years, 15, maybe 19, right in there, very young and very beautiful. And the crazy thing is she was obedient. Now, I don't know how much you'd pay for a young, beautiful, obedient daughter, but that's a kicker right there. That's a great card. And we see this trait come up in her, and she really lives into this identity as being someone who's obedient, she does what is told her to do, even when it's very costly and it's frightening, but she's obedient. Finally, she's brave, and that is incredibly important for this character. She's brave. Now, bravery or courage is not the lack of fear. Bravery or courage is fear being, fear being present but acting anyways. Courage is not just acting without fear. Courage, bravery, is taking the fear that you feel and acting anyway. She was brave. She was this noble, amazing young woman. And she has been raised up in an empire that is ruthless and always conquering outwards. Remember when we started this series, we talked about how Xerxes, King Xerxes, held a banquet for 187 days, and it wasn't just to have a party, though they really did that. It was to plan the wars to overtake Greece. They continued their westward march. So she's this brave, amazing young woman. And we find her having gone from an orphan all the way up to sitting on the throne next to Xerxes. She's the queen of the Medo-Persian Empire. Now, the, the time when she ruled was around 440 B.C. The Jewish people would have been exiled in 586. So there's like 140 years where the Jewish people have lived in captivity in the land of Babylon, which was then defeated by Persia, and this is the world she lives in. This is the world she's going to be brave in, and this is the world that God's going to use her to transform. And what we need to do today is understand that she has gone from this peasant girl all the way to the inner courts of King Xerxes. And she has great influence, but she's also in dire peril because there are some people out to get her. There are some people out to get Esther. So today what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at some of these characteristics and the traits that we just described. We're going to look at it from the book of Esther, chapter 9 through 16. We pick up this story really where um, there's a decree that's been given by King Xerxes, her husband, to kill all the Hebrew people, all the Jewish people, to annihilate them empire-wide, over 127 provinces. He must not have known he married a Hebrew girl, right? So this order's been given. It's a devastating order. And her uncle, Mordecai, is grief-stricken by it. Mordecai's this awesome, tough Hebrew guy who is a third-generation Jewish exile. He's been living in exile all his life. He's never been to the homeland of Jerusalem. And so he's living in exile, and he would not bow the knee to the kind of henchman of the story, Haman. And Haman was kind of the head of all the nobles. 
And Mordecai and Haman did not get along. And Haman's the one who manipulated the king to kill all the Jewish people. Sounds like a Shakespearean play, doesn't it? But it happened in real history, and we're going to read about how Esther responded. Hathak went back and reported to Esther what Mordecai had said. Then she instructed him to say to Mordecai, all the king's officials and the people of the royal provinces know that for any man or woman who approaches the king in the inner court without being summoned, the king has but one law, that they be put to death unless the king extends the golden scepter to them and spares their life. Mordecai had said, Esther, you've got to go to the king and protect us. Protect your people. And she says, well, if I do and I'm not summoned, I could be executed. But 30 days, Esther says, but 30 days have passed since I have last called to go to the king. So the edict is hanging over the Hebrew people and she can't wait another 30 days. So Esther's words were reported back to Mordecai and he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you're in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will perish. And who knows, Esther but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai. Go, gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. When we talk about Esther, we must engage the conversation of costly obedience. Costly obedience. There are times to obey where it's easy and it's beneficial to us. There are times to obey where it's very costly and it's very frightening. But in this story, timing is everything. And the overarching, all-supreme hand of God is working things out so that we will see his hand move and God's people be saved. But what we recognize is this, is that God is arranging the things that are about to happen in Esther, the book of Esther chapter 6. The king, Xerxes, remember him? He's laying in bed one night, and he's got a little bout of insomnia. Anybody here ever not be able to sleep? Miserable, isn't it? By the end, you're like laying there, and you're half figuring out, you know you know what frogs are? The answer, bland and sea. I think they're amazing, and then you realize like, I think I'm weird in between sleep and reality. I need to go to sleep. And you lose your mind, so you open, turn on a light, open a book, maybe you read, you do something like that. We're dealing with sleepless in Susa right now. Ah, first service didn't laugh either. I thought that was a great title. You need to know my self-esteem is attached to some of your laughter on bad jokes. You need to work on that. It'd mean a lot to me. All right, so sleepless in Susa. Oh, you're brutal. All right, so um, sleepless King's laying there, and what does the king do? What does the king do when he couldn't sleep? He has the record keepers go and get the chronicles of his kingdom and come and read how great he is. (laughs) I love these kind of people. Tell me about me and give me rest, right? So they're reading through the story of King Xerxes' reign. And it comes to light that this faithful Jew who's living in exile, Mordecai, thwarted a plot. There was a plot to kill, assassinate King Xerxes. Mordecai did what was right, and he reported it. The two people who were going to kill him were uh, the keepers of the gate, the king's gate. So they have been like the secret service. And they were going to let assassins in and kill King Xerxes. Now Xerxes is laying there, he's reading, he's hearing it read, and he remembers that he was saved, but he didn't know it was Mordecai who had saved him. Because after Mordecai did this good thing, Haman was promoted. And life got worse for Mordecai. Haman was promoted. And Xerxes says to his attendant, was anything good ever done for Mordecai because of his goodness to me? And they said, no, not so much. Well, is there anybody out there who can help me with some ideas? And the guy said, okay, let me look. He goes out to the king's courtyard, and who's hanging out in the king's courtyard but Haman? Haman's hanging out there. And what we recognize in this is Haman is getting ready to play his part in God's 
divine kind of dark comedy here. Haman's getting ready to play his part in it. I want to jump and just talk for a minute about costly obedience. You have in this story someone who's out for the blood of your people. Mordecai was hated by Haman. He hated, Haman hated Mordecai so much that he would not be satisfied just to kill him. He wanted to kill all the people related to him. He wanted to annihilate all the Jews. Is it starting to sound a little frightfully like 1942 in here? Right? You think of what's going on and think, my goodness, my goodness, he hates him. He hates him. And it's God who kept the king up at night. And it's God who who will deliver. But we recognize in this story there is an obedience that is required of a young lady that goes beyond what is most likely her ability because she was called to act now. She was called to act now. She must act or she must abdicate. She was there for such a time as this. She was put in a place to act or to abdicate. And what we recognize that is if she didn't act, she may not have lost her throne, but she would have abdicated God's purposes for her life. If she didn't act, she may have stayed in power, but the purpose of her life would have been void and forfeit. We don't often think of the term abdication that much, and I believe it was Prince Edward who was an heir to the British throne who fell in love with a girl who was in the movies in Hollywood. He abdicated the British throne And we know the queen is Elizabeth. Abdication leaves a void. And her action takes us to a point where we get to hold two stories up together. That story I was telling you where Haman is creepily hanging out in the courtyard while people try to sleep. And then let's tell another story and just kind of hold them up together. Because Haman had this plot to kill and he was really excited that he was going to kill Mordecai. He had set up a 150-foot-tall pole to use Mordecai as a little shish kebab on. He was going to skewer him on the pole because if Mordecai won't bow at the king's gate, he'll scream for mercy in public, and that was his motivation. The pole was set up in Haman's yard. And then we find, if we jump to chapter 7 of this story and kind of hold these in tandem, there's this other thing going on where Esther has gone to the king. He spared her life, but now the rubber meets the road. She has to confront Haman in front of the king. Remember, Haman had been invited to a banquet with Xerxes, Esther, and Haman. Third wheel, remember? We talked about that. They're having date night, and Haman's excited to be there. So we have this situation where Esther is in this process of confronting and acting She set up a banquet, and she's ready to have this conversation, and she's ready to confront something. But let's talk about the tension in the room. When Haman comes to this meal, he would have been a little bruised and beat up because he had already lost a battle earlier in the day. Remember, earlier that day, the king couldn't sleep. Haman was in the courtyard. And so the king, wanting to honor Mordecai, calls, him, calls Haman in and he says, I have a question for you. What would you do for the king to honor one of his nobles who has done a good thing? And Haman, being completely selfish, selfless, thinks, oh my goodness, he's about to show some love to Haman. It's time for me. And he says, you know what I'd do? I would give him a horse that you ride on. Ooh, and I would have him wear your clothes. Okay, you shouldn't be good with that. That's weird. If you ever had a guy be like, hey, bro, I like a shirt. Can I have it? No. But that's what Haman's doing. He's like, and, um, oh, the final thing. I almost forgot about this. Sorry, I'm about a seven and three eighths. I would like, uh, or I mean, this person, you know, wink, wink, nudge, nudge, would love to wear a crown and should be paraded through the streets as a hero of the empire. And the king looks at Haman and says, yes, awesome job, Haman. Go and do so for Mordecai. Oh. Not only someone else, but someone you hate. Then Haman had to hold the little rope in the horse's mouth. I super hate my life. And drag this horse with Mordecai through the streets. So he gets to the banquet that night. 
And now he's not only ticked, he's enraged and he's ashamed and he is gonna go for broke. And this is what happens. Esther lays out a plea to the king and says, I have but one request. And the king says, tell me your request. I'll give you anything. And this for her is the moment where she will either live or die because she's about to stand up to the most powerful person in the empire outside of Xerxes. And Xerxes is emotional, he's fickle, and he's not real loyal. Remember his first wife got the old heave-ho when she didn't come out and do what he wanted, she knows her head's on the chopping block. And she says this, if I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. If you're a husband in the room and your wife comes and says, save my life, you're like, who needs beating, right? If you're, you, you'd be like, what? Who's trying to hurt you? She says, grant me my life and spare my people. This is my petition, and this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have been quiet. But no such distress would justify disturbing the king. Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is this man? Where is he? Um, What man has dared to do such a thing? Okay, so you feel this tension building, and she's getting kind of to the point of just save us, just spare us. And Xerxes is now ticked off. Who's trying to hurt you? And Haman's sitting there with his plate of food like, dude, somebody's going to get it. This is awesome. I wonder who it is. He doesn't know she's a Jew. And he's eating his shawarma. Oh, man. <laughs> and she goes, it's him. It's this evil man, Haman. Oh, man, can you imagine the feeling like, hang on, did you invite me to dinner to kill me? That's what it would feel like, because that's kind of what happens. Haman plays the shish kebab, and the king takes him and impales him on the pole he had intended for Mordecai. But you look at the cost of obedience and the fearful nature of obedience, and we recognize that we must act or abdicate. So to apply this to our lives right here today, let's do three things. The first thing we need to do is ask a question. I told you if you weren't willing to do it, don't say we will during baptism, right? Will you act or will you abdicate on the baptismal vows we gave to Keegan? See, we're a church that strangely is growing. I I don't understand it. If you're like, I wonder how Eric did this. He didn't. He's bad at it. I don't know how it's growing, but I do know this. We have a number of children in our church, and we are pushing Shake Out three years old through fifth grade this fall, and we are asking you to act on behalf of the children of this church to act or to abdicate your baptismal vows, and your vow to help train them up and create a community where they can grow in their faith. People often say, how do you make a a teaching applicable? You do this. You ask people to act very specifically. We desperately are in need of teachers because our church has grown to about a 1,000 people, and you go, oh, my goodness. It's more than when we were just a little church and didn't have much. We need you to act. Your purposeful existence starts right in this teaching. How will you act in response to the need of God's people today? How will you act to train children up in the way that they should go so that when they're old, they don't depart from it? See, we remember that this life is not just this life here, it's the life to come. We are working on behalf of eternity and bringing God's kingdom to bear presently. How will you act in light of your baptismal vow? Or will you abdicate? When we look at Esther's life, we realize that the costly nature of her obedience was fearful, it was overwhelming, and she didn't know what to do. It was fearful and overwhelming. But it's better, it's better to be honest and real about what we're called to be than to live in some false delusion that we think everything's fine and kind of live like Haman. We're gonna go get ours and get all we can for us to our own peril. We must be people who live faithfully into our vows to either act on the things God calls us to do or to abdicate but not be lukewarm somewhere in between. The next thing is that God is speaking and it might be time for us as a church to really listen. Is God speaking to you? 
because I believe that Mordecai could be talking to you in this story as much as he is to Esther. You may think you're safe. You may be saved. But if you don't live your life out faithfully, your faith will atrophy. Your faith will atrophy. Has anybody ever injured themselves, like you hurt your knee, and in like three weeks your thigh's like that big around? And you're like, what happened to the muscle? It atrophied. It died off. You'll lose connection. You and your family will wither. We have to understand that God is speaking and it's time to listen. Esther was afraid to approach the king. Whoever said that Christian life in this world would be easy? I haven't. We can't sit here and pretend that God isn't speaking because you and I both know the pain of disobeying him. Has anybody else ever had that? Here's where I probably thin our church out to about, well, quite a bit. I'm going to tell you of how I've failed. And I did a magnificent job at failure. I was um, over by the back door one Sunday morning um, just kind of quieting my head down before uh, I came on to teach. And a family, uh, husband and wife, pulled into the farmhouse. I mean, the farmhouse looks like the most hopping restaurant in Zealand on Sunday mornings, but they're not open. They just loan us their parking. And they're like, open the doors and stuff. They couldn't get in. And they're looking at each other like, what's going on? And I was kind of like, <laughs> you know, laughing at them because it's a compassionate thing to do. And, um, and I'm, I'm laughing. And the Lord very clearly said, go invite them. I'm the pastor of a church. That is the easiest thing in the world to do. And I was like, oh, Lord, I got I, I to gotta preach in just a minute. I, I'm sorry, I can't. And it was like constant. It was like an increasing pressure. Go do it. Go do it. And I watched them walk towards their car as I argued with God. I didn't want to make them uncomfortable. Maybe they just wanted food and they didn't want to go to church. And it's fine. I just need to preach and be a Christian, but not to them. And I mean, I, if you had been back there, you'd be like, that man's a lunatic. We shouldn't be here. I was talking to myself at a, out an empty window, having a full conversation, fully disobeying God. They got in their car and I was like, they, they just wanted food. And, and literally, all that ran across my mind was the words, don't you have a table full of food? And I was like, I can't do it. And then I came and preached and thought, at some moment, it's going to be like, cow! <laughs> and just a little crystallized piece of charcoal, because I felt this sickness in me that I wasn't willing to do what I was called to do. And God was speaking, and it was time to listen and obey. I want to tell you something. It is lame to feel that way. And I've felt that way more than once in my life. And there are times I'll walk back there during church and pray that they make the same mistake twice, but they haven't yet. We as a church must be willing to obey costly and name when we fail and not do it twice. We must be able to say, is God speaking? And then listen and attend to it. Esther's words, if I perish, I perish. Jesus' words, not my will, but yours be done. What will the great refrain, be from our life? What will the costly obedience cause us to cry out one day? We have to be people who can no longer sit back and think this is for someone else to do because we recognized that we have been placed in this place for such a time as this. Your purpose in this life starts with your redemption in Jesus Christ, your transformation by the Holy Spirit, in your life giving witness to that truth in this community and the world beyond. It is time to ask the question, where have I been placed and have I been placed here with purpose? And if you're a Christian, your life has absolutely been placed here with purpose. You are a purposeful part of what God's doing in your school, in your work, in your neighborhood. Just think of the conversations that happen those, in those three spheres, on sports teams, in bands, in theater, Maybe to stay in the hospital. You're called to that place for such a time as this. Paul, the apostle, thought prison was a great ministry opportunity. We have to recognize that we justify things that God and Scripture do not. We'll often say, I just don't know if God can use me where I'm at. Here's the best news ever. He can't use you where you're not. Right? Be like, well, I would really serve God if I was in Cuba but I'm not there, sorry. No, no, God has you here. 
He means to make use of your life. And we obsess about things that are not ours to have. And we miss the purpose of this life because we don't believe that God's sovereign hand has placed us here to transform the world around us with his power. This church is called to a costly obedience today. I know how busy you are. I know how busy. Erica and I have three kids, three different sports teams, different things going on. We could justify anything. Busy's not the issue. Obedience is the issue. There are things we need to stop doing in order to be who we're called to be. It is not easy, but we are called for such a time as this. What will we do with the gift of the gospel given to us today that our life would be transforming the world around us? With a gospel that participates in our lives, how now shall we live? That question is for you to answer in the upcoming days, weeks, years, and months of your life. How now do you live being placed with purpose for such a time as this? Pray with me, please. God, it's not easy to be, uh, to be laid bare when we know that our, that our disobedience is ever screaming in our ear, the things we were supposed to do that we didn't. So God, we just quietly ask for forgiveness in those areas where we haven't listened and where we've abdicated. And then we ask for courage because God, we are afraid but we remind ourselves of Esther, who in the face of much to be afraid of, she still acted. Help us to act in a way that would honor you, Lord Jesus Christ, and tell the wonderful gospel story of how you redeemed sinners like us and gave purpose to lives that were pretty much empty and void until we met you. Lord, help us to be courageous in our obedience even if it costs us. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Friends, please stand. Sing with me. There's a part of me that wants to believe that um, you get all these second chances to obey, and sometimes you do. But the reality is, if we don't believe that our lives for the kingdom matter, we have succumbed to the greatest deception ever. Your life in Christ matters everything to the world around you. And the reality of it is that there should have been some hands that got shaken in this room today that weren't because I didn't obey. May it never be so for us. Again, may we never be so willing to abdicate that for which we were created, to know God, to know the Lord Jesus Christ here and forever. Our hope in this life and the life to come is that we belong body and soul in life and in death to our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. So may our living prove that true. May we live in costly obedience for him, with him, the Lord Jesus Christ, for the redemption of all around us. May the world see and know that yes, it is costly to follow Christ, but all the purpose and the joy of not having to live with disobedience. So as you go from this place, my prayer for you, my hope for you, is that you will find those places of costly obedience and lean in to the one who is ever faithful, ever calling, and ever working to make these broken lives purposeful in eternity. As you do this, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the late Lord turn his face towards you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the church must leave the building. You are dismissed.